Blessed days this Monday. Thank you, Ravi. Well, good evening. You know, it's so nice to be with, with all of you. I see a lot of familiar faces and some new ones, and, and really thankful to this opportunity to be with all of you. You know, <clears throat> like many of you in this room, I was also born in India, and I grew up there. And this is almost right after India got its independence. So when I was growing up, there wasn't a lot of business, but a lot of Hinduism. It's amazing that even after 400 years of subjugation, Hindu values and Hinduism survived and thrived. And that says a lot about the underpinning of its profound values and thinking that, that it survived through all that adversity in India. So, so growing up in India, you know, we grew up with a lot of scarcity. There was scarcity of, you know, you, you could get maybe a couple of liters of kerosene a month, half a kg of rice or sugar a month or something like that. But the only thing that was in plenty were the Hindu values. You know, so when I grew up as a kid, we grew up with a lot of Hindu values. Respect for others, elders, teachers, love for everything, everybody around you. And, and somehow, it, it, it sort of it imbibes in you. And almost every cell of your body sort of gets into those values. And as I grow older, I find that it, it actually impacts everything I do and, and everything I continue to think about. And so, after graduating from IIT Madras in 1973, I came to Canada, got my master's, taught for a year, uh, did my PhD, worked for Motorola in Toronto, moved to Boston in 1984, and so we've been in Boston since then. And then for about 20 years, I was an entrepreneur, built a bunch of companies. But in the last 10 years, I and my wife have been mostly focused on the foundation, working on societal impact. And all along, uh, personal growth and spirituality has always been a matter of great interest to me. So what I want to talk today about are really these three pillars. The economic impact, the economic activity that we're all engaged in, societal impact, how do you live in harmony with the world and the nature around you, and your spiritual growth. You know, these three pillars in, in any individual, any family, any community, the world at large, if you want to see a healthy uh, living environment, we need to build on these three pillars. And these three pillars need a strong foundation. And, and with its deep belief in tolerance and love for all, Hinduism and Hindu values provide that basic foundation. So, Talking about economic participation and economic growth, after India got its independence, you know, in the early stages, Hindus were not a part of the global economic activity. They lacked the confidence, they lacked the education, they lacked the nature of the spirit of adventure. But a lot has changed in 60 years. In 60 years, both things have changed. The, the Hindus have changed, but even more than that, the world has changed. You know, the business cycles have changed. Previously, it took about, if you had an idea, it took about 25 years to develop the idea, and then you actually nurture that idea for 75 years. So we used to have 100-year business cycles. But over the course of time, those business cycles are shrinking. They're getting to be 10 years, four years. So as, and, and it's all driven by innovation. And, and being on the board of MIT for the last 16 years, I get to see it every day, happening right in front of my eyes, whether it's nanotechnology, or drug delivery, or health, or education, or, or energy, any, any of these areas. It's amazing the amount of new ideas that people are coming up with. And this is not just MIT, it's happening all over the world. And even more than that, we live in a world that's so connected that ideas free flow very freely. 
And when ideas flow freely, innovation happens even faster because it's not just one person, but everybody can be part of it. The tools that we use to actually uh, develop this innovation, they're getting democratized, they become cheaper and cheaper. Just to give you an example, 16 years ago, when MIT was trying to sequence the human genome, that project was like millions and millions of dollars. Today, you can actually sequence a human genome for just a few cents. So as tools get democratized, as, as the, the whole globe gets connected, everybody has an opportunity. Everybody has an opportunity to create value, and the value creation has the same value irrespective of where you create it in the world. And so in some ways, we know that the world will continue to change, and, and we've already seen it. If we just look at our own lives in the last 20, 30 years, we live in a very different way than we did 30 years ago, and that's going to continue to happen. So everybody has a choice. Either we can accept the change and lead the change, or we can grudgingly drag our feet. And so the entrepreneurial opportunities to lead this change is, is going to be plenty in, in, uh, in, in the future. And I would say, over the last 60 years, you know, hundreds of millions of Hindus, I would say two, three hundred million, have sort of become a part of the global economy. About one percent of them are actually in, in leadership roles now, leading that change. And, and as this progress continues, it gives an opportunity for a lot of people. So if you look at the innovation, entrepreneurship, globalization, technology, all these things, they're creating, they're very powerful tools. And what's happening is that it, it helps just a few people to create the massive changes and create massive wealth. But the unintended consequence of that approach has been the variation between the haves and have nots. And so there's a lot of people who are not being a part of that economy. And I and my wife for the last 10 years have been sort of looking at ways, how could you, how could you include the people who are not a part of this economy? And in some ways, I think the same tool, the same innovation entrepreneurship that, that's causing this difference can also help you bridge this gap. What do I mean by that? I find that when you look at people, there are three types of people in this world. Some people are oblivious to everything. Some people see a problem and complain about it. Some people see a problem and get all excited about it. And the only difference I see between an impoverished community and a vibrant community is a mix of these people. In a vibrant community, people get, you don't see too many people sitting around and complaining. They get very excited when they see a problem because that's what they want to do. They want to solve problems. And as a result of that, you don't have obvious problems hanging around because people will solve them. Whereas in impoverished communities, problems become chronic, they get deadlocked, people try a little bit, and then they feel victimized, they can't solve it, they feel helpless, and then the only thing they can do is complain. And then a lot of the leadership in those communities revolves around people who can articulate their misery the most. So the steady state that we have reached is that these people are supposed to feel helpless, sit around and complain, and then the government and the foundations are supposed to come and help them out. That's not a sustainable development. So the new approach that we are trying to do is to see if you can actually convert the complainers into problem solvers. So we started a program called the Social Innovation Sandbox in India about 10 years ago. And, and it's been, so far it's been an amazingly uh, good experiment. You know, we have thousands of young men and women who are all energized and want to take charge and solve their own things in their own way. And, and so, and then we have about 50 programs in, in agriculture and healthcare and livelihood and education, all trying to sort of do this and scale them in a, in a big way. And one such beautiful example is Akshay Patra, 
How many, how many of you here don't know about Akshay Patra? Very few. So, so we actually have the founder of Akshay Patra, Mohandas Pai, with us, and I hope he'll, he'll <clears throat> I hope he'll talk a little bit more about that because it does 1.6 million meals every day. We also have our own Vandana Tilak, a dedicated soul who lives here, right in this neighborhood, but her efforts have been enabling thousands of children in India now to go to school and become a part of this economic development. So this tool, this approach of actually getting people to become entrepreneurs, to become problem solvers, is a very powerful tool. And so now we have these programs in not only in India, I don't mean the midday meal program, but, but the approach of enabling people in, in United States is called Entrepreneurship for All. So we have it running in about three different impoverished places in Massachusetts. We also have this program in Canada. So instead of complaining when people get hooked on a problem, you know, you become feverish about that particular problem and you can't stop thinking about it. And, and there's an aha moment when you crack the code. And then you get up in the morning and you're excited about the day. And to me, that is real prosperity. Real prosperity is when people live a fulfilling life where they get up in the morning and they're excited about what they want to do. And, and if, you can, if you can bring that excitement to everybody in this world, to me, that's shared prosperity. And then in terms of spiritual growth, you know, I think sometimes when we deal with innovation, technology, and we can do a lot of things, sometimes it appears like we control a lot of things and we're really in control of the world. We can do a lot of things. We can cure diseases. We can, we can get from point A to point B. And, and, and we can travel fast. And, but what I find is that the more you know about this world, the more you find that there's a bigger unknown. You know, we all thought that we understood the world a little bit, and now there's suddenly this dark matter, a dark energy, and which means, you know, it's 99.99% of the world that none of us know what it's all about. So what happens is that it doesn't matter how much you know, there is a big part of your life is what you don't know. And when you come to those boundaries, you need the underpinnings of, of this philosophical framework to actually deal with it. And if you don't have it, you get lost. And that's what leads to a lot of this depression and, and, and getting lost and losing a purpose in life and so on. So the underpinnings of the spirituality is, is very important. You know, I, uh, let, me, let me just share one thing that I learned uh, last year when I and my wife went to a 10-day Vipassana camp in Yosemite right here in, in California. You know, this is a technique that Buddha came up with 2,500 years ago. And, and he has a very simple theory which says that every time you go through life and you have an emotional experience, it's like drawing a line. And when you draw a line, you have the option of drawing a line in water, you have an option of drawing a line in sand, or you have the option of carving a line in the rock. Of course, the line in the water, you know, goes away. The one in the sand, it heals. But the one in the rock, it stays with you for a long time. And slowly over the course of time, it's all those lines that you're drawn in the rock that drive your behavior as opposed to what's happening in the present. And so, so his whole philosophy is, is, to, is to make sure that you understand life and you don't draw those deep, dark lines in the rocks. So, and that applies very much to business as well. I mean, it's, it's, you know, when you do business, you go through good experiences, bad experiences, but if you have a bad experience and if you draw those deep rock lines, you'll never forget that. And as a result of that, your relationship with people and, and, and your colleagues and everything else gets all colored up. And so, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful philosophy where you, you, you deal with 
the world in terms of what you can control and what you don't control, and you don't worry too much about what you don't control. So, so th those spiritual underpinnings for things that you do in life, in your personal life, in your business life, are very important because the more ambitious you are in terms of either your business or the personal goals that you have, the more trouble you get into, the bigger problems you face, the bigger challenges you face. And that's where you need this underpinning to actually make sure that you can, you can enjoy doing what you're doing. And so in terms of the, the, the foundation that I talked about, Hinduism, so the good thing about Hinduism is that it's a, it's a living thing. It's not something that sits in a museum. What amazes me about Hinduism is its ability to reinvent itself and stay relevant. So, and it's very entrepreneurial in a lot of ways. You know, if you look at all the spiritual leaders that pop up in India, whether it's in villages or talukas or, or, or even, you know, Sai Baba or, or Sri Sri or Amma, Amma, uh, Hugging Saint, a lot of these people, it's amazing that how they can inspire millions of people and, 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 and build that, that following. And in some ways, I used to feel very bad that a lot of these people build all these big things, but they don't build a structure around that. They don't build a governance. They don't build these institutions that last for centuries. But coming to think about it, in fact, that's exactly what leads to that entrepreneurial energy and, and, and reinvents itself and stays relevant. You know, if you look at the Vatican, for example, that structure is so powerful that if you have an inspired leader somewhere in, the, in that whole system, it's very hard for that person to come up and, and, and establish, uh, redefine that religion to stay relevant with the, with the world. And so, so I think, I, think I, I like the fact that this Hinduism is, is not a stagnant thing. It's something that gets redefined. I'm even more excited that the young people, both in US and India, embrace these values, redefine, talk about all the bad things that exist in there so that we don't hide from things that are not right, but also redefine and embrace them and be proud of these, of these values. Let me just give you two examples. Within the audience, we have Mihir Megani. Mihir, where are you? So, so Mihir is right here. Mihir is a doctor, young doctor. And a few years ago, he founded this Hindu America Foundation where a lot of his, uh, his, you know, his age group, second generation uh, kids, all came together. And what I like about them is that how, when they look at things, they look at it very objectively. They're very clear about what's good, what's bad. And they, and they, and they include this foundation into all the three pillars at a very young age. It's not like you become successful in business and then you make a lot of money and then you start looking after the society and your own spirituality and everything else, they have a very integrated way of living. In India, for example, um, we, we have uh, Yudhishthira Krishnadas Ji, I think he's in the back there. You know, I, I met him in Hubli when, a long time ago. He was 23 years old when, when he gave up his medical practice and, and joined and, and chose a life of service. And, and it was amazing when he was managing the Akshay Patra kitchen in Hubli as a young man, 26, 27 year old. But, but it's amazing the amount of responsibility and the, and the big things that they can run at such a young age with such devotion and with such calm and such, such clear thinking about what they're trying to do. And, and so I'm very hopeful that, that the Hinduism will continuously get refined and, and as long as we keep our mind open to those changes, that it'll stay relevant and, and deep-rooted in, in very basic values of tolerance and accept, acceptance of everybody and love. Maybe I'm hoping, my hope, is that out of all of this energy and, and, and inspired thinking, we will one day get another young person like Vivekananda 
who'd come and lead the world. and bring about the much needed harmony and peace that the world needs right now. But until that time, until that happens, I have an action item for all of us in this room. I hope we feel proud about the basic Hindu values and incorporate all those good things in our lives, in everybody's life around us, and then take care of all the people who need that help who live around you so that we can create a harmonious society and a harmonious world and sustain the environment and, and, uh, and the fantastic uh, opportunity that we all have to give back. Thank you. Thank you, Desh.